After a very nice looking sleep, I love how the Green Knight opened his eyes a little bit. And he's like, it's not Christmas yet. Like, yeah. I need a... He hits snooze. <laughs> <laughs> the Green Knight totally hits snooze on that. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, you're Come early. Wait. I'll chop your head off in the morning. Come on, Nobody man. likes an early party guest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Welcome to the Art of Costume Blogcast. I'm Elizabeth Joy Glass. And I'm Spencer Williams. Yeah, did you forget that? <laughs> <laughs> that was like a long pause. Well, all the LaCroix is going to your head. You need real water. It is real water. LaCroix is real water. It's not the same. <sighs> hey, Elizabeth. Hi, Spencer. <laughs> How are you? I'm fine. <laughs> This is so awkward. <laughs> Sorry, guys. We started this argument before we started the podcast, and it just hasn't ended. <laughs> let's leave our uh, argument behind, and maybe <laughs> let's talk about some costumes. Okay. Talk about some costumes. Talk about a trippy movie. Guys, this week, we watched The Green Knight. Whoa. That was, like, just something else. <laughs> Yeah, that was one of the weirder things. Of all the movies I've seen in my life, that was certainly one of them. Yeah. And it's it's a gorgeous film. Like, if you're able to go to the theater and see it, it's definitely something that should be seen in the theaters. But for a Arthurian legend movie, that's not what I was expecting. I had to take the weekend to process it. I watched it a couple days ago. And it was keeping me up at night. I was just like, what did I miss? <laughs> what am I not getting? I know it was beautiful. Like, it was stunning. The costumes we'll get into, but were absolutely stunning. And, like, the cinematography, the acting was brilliant. Oh, you know, yeah. The dialogue was good. I just was so lost in the story. But, like, after I've had a couple days to process it, I think I really liked it. It just needs some time to sink in a little bit. Same. I'm like, you need to watch the movie, give it a couple of days, do some research yeah. <laughs> to understand the movie, and then you like it. <laughs> and it works. So, this like, movie is like a whole assignment in itself. <laughs> yeah, we've we've been trying to prepare research for this, but we just had a lot of thoughts and feelings even before the podcast. <laughs> yeah. I was just like, huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, well, let's get into it then. Let's just break this down together with everyone. Let's get into it, Spencer. Do you want to read off a summary? I do. And I'm very excited because this week, Elizabeth wrote the summary and I did absolutely nothing. You're welcome. <laughs> I didn't ask you to. You did that. I know. We sound like a married couple in this episode. Uh, we do. We lived <laughs> together for like a year, so I think that like... But even when we lived together, I don't feel like we argued. That's true. Maybe it's just because we've known each other for so long. The podcast is tearing us apart. <laughs> <laughs> You're my podcast husband. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the Green Knight. In the Dark Ages of Britain, young Gawain, the nephew of the legendary King Arthur and heir to his throne, while content with his life but lacking ambition, he struggles to find a place in his uncle's court. His fortunes change on Christmas Day when the mysterious Green Knight challenges the knights of King Arthur's court to land a blow on him, then see it returned by him next Christmas. Gawain steps forward, accepting the challenge, and decapitates the Green Knight, who rises and rides off with his head. Prompted by his uncle the following Christmas, Gawain sets off on his legendary journey to meet the knight for his return blow. I mean, that basically sums up about everything I understood of this wonderful Christmas movie. I mean, I was feeling the Christmas spirit. Yeah, that that's like a very basic summary. So if you have not seen The Green Knight yet, uh, this is your spoiler warning. Get yourself to a theater and watch it, if you care. Don't blame us for spoilers. <laughs> to be fair, I'm not sure how much I could spoil, because I'm still trying to figure it out for myself. That's but true. But yes, go see it. Take the time to watch it. Yeah. 
it's it's this legend is hundreds of years old as well so if we're spoiling anything for you i don't know what to tell you literally you've had time you've had multiple centuries <laughs> <laughs> elizabeth bring us behind the wardrobe i will bring you behind the wardrobe so the green knight was directed by david lowry and costume design was by malgosia terzanska if that is not how you pronounce your name i'm very sorry We've done our best. Uh, but her notable work, you'll know her from Hell or High Water, You Were Never Really Here, The Jinx, The Life and Deaths of David Durst, Robert Durst, oops, uh, Maggie's Plan, and most prominently, Stranger Things. Ooh. So you'll you know her from something. I feel like everyone will know her from something. <laughs> but she did really good job on this, really capturing 14th century, I think they were saying in 14th century England. She hasn't really done any interviews <laughs> about the costumes. There's not a, really a lot of information about the film out there at all. I found like a Vanity Fair article that had a couple of qu quotes from David Lowry. All in all, not a ton of information out there about it, but... One thing that is very clear is the whole costumes of the film, very, very influenced by Eastern Orthodoxy art, especially from the Byzantine Empire. That's a really awesome catch, by the way. You really see it in King Arthur and Guinevere, uh, but then it's just kind of like spattered throughout the film. Now that you said that about the Byzantine art, like that's all I can see now. That's such a good um, reference. Yeah. The costumes for this were just absolutely stunning. I think it's because, like, the quote-unquote history of King Arthur falls between, like, the fall of the Roman Empire, the, like, Anglo-Saxon invasion, and it's, like, a time in, like, British history that nobody really knows a ton about. Like, nobody was really keeping records of it, but they remained Christian even after Rome pulled out of Britain and the only the Christian church or Catholic church that survived kind of after the fall of the Roman Empire was the Eastern Orthodox Church. That was the only one that was like still consistently like strong because the uh, Eastern Empire stayed intact for so much longer. So I feel like that's why they kind of pulled that over. But I'm not sure. Wait, I'm confused now. Is King Arthur a real person? No. <laughs> so, so I really like King, Ar King Arthur legends. It's thought that perhaps King Arthur was like a war chief in England during this kind of in-between time in England where nobody really knows what was going on. Because the name Arthur like creeps up very just like out of the blue after this time period and more, like, noble lines. So it's, like, very ambiguous as to whether or not King Arthur was real because through through French romanticism, English retellings of it, it's really just, it's been muddied. Like, nobody knows anymore. But it, it does fall with, the legends fall within, like, a certain period of time, kind of. Most people put it, like, more into the Middle Ages than, like, right after the fall of Rome, but... okay. Wow, Elizabeth is really taking us to school today. I, I like, I have a whole audiobook. <laughs> the teacher really jumped out of you today. <laughs> I just totally went on a rant. <laughs> um, sorry about that. But yeah, that it kind of falls in that period. And like, Rome fell and like, the church didn't, in Europe, and it didn't really fall with it. It just kind of had to like, rebuild itself along with the rest of Europe. So, like, the Eastern Empire, which did not fall um, at the same time, their art and stuff is much more prevalent for that, like, post-Roman, the Byzantine period, where they're putting this into, I feel like. Not all my facts are 100% <laughs> correct. <laughs> so, <laughs> don't quote me. Because um, they made it a very kind of, like, ambiguous where exactly this was falling, but... That's what I got. <laughs> With that being said, <laughs> let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the Green Knight and all the costumes. And we're going to break down this plot as best as we can. Yeah. And I'm excited to talk about this with you. 
and save some more of this King Arthur facts that you seem to have, because I want to hear more. I know. It's all deep in there, that, so they're just going to pop up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> See you after the break. back from break um as we were in break elizabeth and i were still trying to go through our king arthur facts so we're we have a lot of history going on behind the scenes right now (laughs) i'm obsessed (laughs) are you ready to do this yeah (laughs) put your textbook away it's time to get started with the podcast you don't want me to pull out my king arthur research book no i do actually i do i do keep it close all right, so the movie starts with Gawain. He wakes up in a, I will say, a brothel, where his lover, Essel, is dressing for church and playfully rejecting his advances. He heads home pretty hungover, hella hungover, half-dressed, he's missing his boots, and his mother is not very pleased. Um, but they have to get ready for Christmas dinner, because it's Christmas time in Camelot. It's Christmas! Our new favorite Christmas movie. Um, he's getting ready for dinner at King Arthur's court, but his mother decides to stay home because she says she's not feeling well, which was not believable. None of us believed that. She looked perfectly fine. Um, at the court festivities, Gawain is called by King Arthur to come and sit at his side. It is revealed that Gawain's mother is a sister of King Arthur, and Gawain basically says his mother is not feeling so good and she will not be joining While this is going on, Gawain's mother is conducting a ritual that summons the Green Knight, entering... She's a witchy witch. (laughs) Gawain's mother summons the Green Knight, and he appears at King Arthur's court and challenges the knights of the round table to a game. The Green Knight basically says any knight that lays a blow on him must then be reciprocated the same exact way a year from now next christmas at the green chapel all the knights basically shut up because no one wants to actually play this game but gawain wanting to prove himself stands up and decides to take on the challenge and king arthur gives gawain the excalibur and decides to behead the green knight at the gawain <laughs> the gawain knight <laughs> green knight <laughs> <laughs> the Gawain Knight. Oh, Thanks, no, Spencer. Not again. You just lost like 20 years of your age. <laughs> <laughs> not young Natasha again. <laughs> the Green Knight then stands up, picks up his head, and rides off into the distance, laughing his ass off. So that is a summary of the first couple scenes here. And Elizabeth, we have a lot to break down here. I know. So, first. There is, like, that opening scene where a crown descends on Gawain's head and he catches on fire, which was amazing. And he just has this gigantic gold cloak over himself. Oh, that's such a beautiful image. I love that golden robe. And I am 100% obsessed with the crowns in this movie. That is one of the best parts of this film. Yes! It is one of the best parts of this film, and that's one of those bits taken from uh, religious iconography of the time. To have, like, a halo behind your head like that indicates that you're, like, some sort of saint or an angel. So it's really a way to make Arthur and Guinevere appear as, like, saintly, good, fair rulers. Yeah. They... They just look so good on them. It's such a great, it's such a great crown. I'm just obsessed with it. I love the halo shape. I love the little, almost like beams of light that looks like it's just coming from the crown. It's so beautiful. And then Guinevere, I love the drape that's also coming from the crown as well. Yeah, the veil. Yeah, the costumes in this these opening scenes are just so great. Yeah, and it's it's really. Guinevere and Arthur, they just call them the queen and the the king in this. 
no clue yeah. why. Um, but there, his cloak and her gown, you can see, like, it really does look like mosa- like mosaics from the Byzantine era. And it's just, it's beautiful because it makes them stand out from everybody else. I love the cloak that King Arthur is wearing. Um, I love, like you said, like almost a mosaics on the cape. I also love the use of the five-pointed star so much. Um, King Arthur has the necklace um, underneath his cape. It's really cool. I did a little bit of research into the five-point star to figure out what it means. And the values of King Arthur's cart, court. My goodness, the pronunciation of my words today. King Arthur's court. It's because I've been watching Mayor of Easttown a lot lately. Uh, oh, 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 wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you trying to make fun of how I talk? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I said at all. I'm from that same exact area, Spencer. <laughs> okay, keep going. Tell us these values. <laughs> Generosity. <laughs> mm-hmm. Courtesy. Courtesy. Chastity. <laughs> Stop it. I can't get through them. <laughs> I'm sorry. Gen- Generosity. Courtesy. Chastity, chivalry, and piety? Piety. 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 There you go. Those are the five values of the five-pointed star. Wow, that took a long time to get through. Anyways, I like the necklace. I think it's really cool. (laughs) I'm glad you brought that up because I had completely forgotten about that. So I was like kind of confused when I saw it. And I was like, okay, so his sister's a witch. Is Arthur... Like, a witch, but, like, King Arthur's magic always surrounds him, but he doesn't really participate in magic himself, so I was a little confused. But no. Well, also, I love how they have Merlin at this table, but they don't really go as far as, like, really addressing that to Merlin, but... Yeah. I like this, like, badass representation of him, though. Yeah, it is cool. They definitely go for a more, like, druid-y look to him. Um, because Merlin's often dissociated as he, like, coming from, like, a druid background. Um, but I also liked seeing, like, all the knights at the round table, but it's like, wow, they're all old. (laughs) And they all look exactly the same. Yeah. Yeah. They're all wearing, like, the exact same outfits. Looks like they're all wearing the necklace that King Arthur's wearing. Mm -hmm. I will say, like... Arthur, Guinevere, and Gwen are, like, really the only ones that stand out. He's looking good in his his tunic here. Ooh, I love that tunic. It is, like, a really cool kind of, like, paneled tunic in a lightish blue color, and uh, he looks awesome. Yeah, it's kind of like, it's like a light blue. It They were careful about using the color green, in the movie, because they were like, we don't want to be on the nose about this. Yeah. <laughs> so they didn't, they kind of tried to stay away from it. But like, when he's next to the Green Knight, who also like doesn't really have a lot of green, but is kind of, it's kind of like an undertone for that character. I felt like it kind of pulled out some green tones in Gwen as well from that tunic, because it's like, he is, like, green in terms of, like, he hasn't really done much with his life. Like, they all say, like, oh, you're a young man, you're a young man. Like, he ha- he hasn't really had a life outside of Camelot. Yeah. King Arthur literally asked him to tell tell him, like, a tale or whatever. And yeah. <laughs> Gawain's like, I don't have any. I've done literally nothing with my life. <laughs> yeah. that That was so sad when he's, like, comes over and Arthur's like, you're my nephew. And, like... I don't know anything about you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but before we move on, Dev Patel plays Gawain really, oh really well. Gosh. So he does. For the lack of dialogue in this film, they really use what dialogue they have to really like push the performance to like a really he, awesome level. Yeah. Without saying anything, he acts his ass off. So yeah. Um. So we have to talk about the Green Knight because this is one of two times that we see him in this film. 
It's the best armor I've seen since Game of Thrones. Ooh, y'all hear that? The best armor since she's seen since Game of Thrones. It actually does have a Game of Thronesy type feel. It did remind me of the Night King when I saw him the first time. Yeah. Um, I love his armor. It's very kind of um, Sleepy Hollow in a way. That's what it kind of reminded yeah. me. Yeah. Especially with that, like that woody aspect to him like i really wasn't expecting that for him to look like a tree that was cool so it felt like he was more growing out of his suit than like he was wearing a suit yeah like he's been wearing it for a very very long time the green knight is supposed to represent in part amongst other things his nature so that makes complete sense of him like kind of growing into his suit i thought it looked really awesome um, before we move on, why did Gawain, he could have, he could have cut this man down anywhere. Why did he pick the head? I don't <laughs> know. Gawain, I would have did a hand or something. Yeah, because he's like, you can, and he like literally kneels down in front of him and he's like, you can blow me any way you like. Like, just like he's like, you can just like give me a little cut and that'll be all. He just chops his freaking head off. I'm like, I'm like, that's why your uncle asked you if you understood the challenge. <laughs> yeah. Did you understand assignment? I think not. Because now you're going to get your head chopped off. Like, what if he just cut his hair a little bit, you know, gave him like a little haircut with the Excalibur. And just chopped off one of his branches. Yeah. <laughs> one of his branches. Oh, I mean, that's a good idea because Gwen Gawain doesn't have any branches. Anyways. No, no, he doesn't. <laughs> he probably would have just been like. Let's give you take some of your hair off. Okay, you're good to go. <laughs> Overall, the opening scenes to this movie are very beautiful. So, Elizabeth, do you want to talk about the rest of these opening scenes? Yeah. So, in the subsequent year, uh, Gawain tries to put the challenge behind him, forget about it. He continues to spend his nights drinking and with Essel as. The challenge date arrives, Arthur decides to visit Gwen and tell him, like, yo, you got to complete this challenge. And Gwen's like, eh, but do I have to? And he's like, yeah, you have to. So they prepare him for his trip. Uh, but right before he sets off, his mother gives him this, like, little handmade belt. And she says, if you wear this the entire time and come back with it on you will remain unharmed. That's a good way to put it. Um, some of my absolute favorite costumes of this section, and really in the entire film, are the costumes made for Gawain's mother, played by a actress I absolutely love, Sarita Chowdhury. She is so stunning. I just love her. She's so beautiful and like fun to look at. And her costumes just are made for her so perfectly. And as well as uh, Gawain's sisters, too. I love how they put their hair up in the different shapes. And I love the fabrics and textiles used to build all of their costumes. Yeah, and... They're beautiful. Here's where you can see... So, I I looked up dates. Um, so, the Roman Empire withdrew from Britain in 383. And then, it's not the Norman Conquest. It's the Anglo-Saxon Conquest. In 601, that's kind of the time period that Arthur falls in. And his mother and sisters have much more of a Roman influence to their costume as opposed to a Eastern Orthodox Christian Catholic like the king and queen. Because clearly they're still practicing magic, probably holding to some of the older religions. And so you see the like the draping and like... Instead of, like, the tight, you know, covered up mosaic, you see the more free drapery of, like, the old Roman Empire. That's a really good point. There is a lot of draping in their costumes in particular. Wow, you're, like, such an expert on this stuff, Elizabeth. You should start a podcast. Uh, no. I I don't know that much. Oh. <laughs> there's, so, there's so much. It's ridiculous, Spencer. There is so much out there about King Arthur. There's, like... It's insane. So many people have tried to figure this out. It's nuts. There's even grave sites for him and Guinevere in France. What? Yeah. It's weird. I should read a book sometime. I'll, f I'll send you this audiobook. <laughs> <laughs> um, another great part I liked from this section was 
the part where all the kids are watching the little play that's happening, kind of showing... Yeah, the puppet show. Yeah, the puppet show. I like this part specifically because it shows a lot of also the costuming. The costume designers are not just responsible for the main character and King Arthur. Like, they have to dress everyone. And when you're looking at, like, these images of all the kids watching the puppet show... They each have, like, individual costumes that work well together. Yeah. The color scheme works perfectly. Um, lots of blues, lots of whites and tans, um, lots of scarves. It's definitely feeling like a cold environment. Well, it's well, December. It's Christmas time. It's December in England. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's cold. But, yeah, I loved, I loved those little scenes because yeah, it was just really nice to look at. And it, like, it made you feel cold because clearly they're not going for the more fantastical elements of King Arthur. They're very much more grounding it in reality, which you can tell in these parts with the village children. I also love when they're preparing him to go and it's like a whole ceremony where he gets like his shield and it's like, ugh, that's so like medieval old world like blessing him before his journey oh yeah when they lowered the chainmail onto him yeah Ugh, i would love to i need to make myself a chainmail suit somehow how can i do this <laughs> i kind of tried to do some chainmail once and i gave up within like half an hour i think <laughs> <laughs> but also that was when i was in high school though so maybe i could should try again <laughs> You also did bring up a good point, though, which I didn't really realize until now. The reasons why earlier when I was kind of confused, I was like, wait, is King Arthur real? Is he not real? I thought it was a legend. But when you just mentioned that, like, they built Camelot to, like, look like it's grounded in reality, that kind of set a light bulb because I've always imagined Camelot as this, like, big magical kingdom kind of like wizard of oz like emerald city type of thing yeah but when you ground it in reality like this like that's when it makes it feel real like this is probably if it existed this is what it actually would have yeah. looked like i mean this is know? even probably a little bit more advanced um but i agree like i think very magical when i think of king arthur because the first like piece of media i really consumed with king arthur in it was the bbc show merlin and that is a very, like, high fantasy, there's a lot of comedy in it, version of the King Arthur story from Merlin's perspective, not King Arthur's. So, like, same, I always have more of a, like, fantasy legend, like, thought of Camelot and King Arthur in my head. This just gets rid of all of that. Especially with King Arthur being so old and sickly, most legends, like, he doesn't, like, make it past being, like, a young man. So it was really interesting to see, or like a middle-aged man. He doesn't really get to die of like natural causes. Right. Well, yeah, I love all that. I liked when he was visiting his like his orange cloak. He's just like little. He looked like he was ready for bed, and it's like, dude, you're visiting. <laughs> Did you not put more clothes on? <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. I love how people are just walking around in like they're essentially nightgowns. I uh, know. I love that. I was like, this is a very free court. Well, Elizabeth, we're about to go on quite the journey. We're going on an adventure! Yeah! After going. Okay. <laughs> I need more tea. <laughs> Are you ready to go on an adventure? Going on an adventure. Did you remember your chain mail? I did. And your your magic belt? I did. I did. I, I remembered everything. <laughs> uh, all right. So Gawain is now on his adventure. He's very reluctant. He was not planning on meeting the Green Knight, but King Arthur's like, you gotta keep your word. You're a knight. Mm -hmm. He's not a knight yet. Right. He's not a knight. He's like a knight in training. Yes. It's like a knight trainee. <laughs> so he's on his way to the Green Chapel. He goes through this little scene where he's just walking on a big long road on a horse. He wanders onto a recently deserted battlefield and encounters a eccentric scavenger who gives Gawain directions to the Green Chapel. After he's given directions, Gawain goes into a woods clearing and finds he's been set up by the scavenger and his friends and is mugged and left for dead. He's tied up and just thrown onto the ground. 
After a very kind of creepy trip out where he sees himself dead in the woods, Gawain snaps to and he's able to get himself free and continues on foot without any of his cool armor or clothes until he finds an abandoned home where he is able to finally get some sleep. Kind yes. of. Not really. Kind of. Um, but yeah, he sets off looking very dapper in his his chain melt. He's got his belt from his mom, which she wove and put like a little piece of wood in. And I did just realize that it's like a very, very deep, like muddy gray green, the belt. I just actually realized that too, as you were talking about that. I'm like, oh, it's kind of a greenish color. That's a good point. But um, it kind of just blends in with his chain mail though. But then he's got that great, like almost like a burnt yellow goldish cape cloak and like that thing wonderful it's beautiful that's that's definitely one of my favorite costumes of the entire film i love that cloak so much it looks like for a velvety fabric almost yeah it just looks so comfy and warm and comfortable i love it so much i love 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 and yellow looks so good on dev patel also it just it does all these colors against the backdrop of the very gloomy camelot in the background it just works for like a very beautiful painting it does that was one thing i liked about watching this i felt like you could take out like all the dialogue and just have someone recite the actual like Gwen and the green knight story over it kind of and it would have all made too. sense yeah it's amazing how much you could get away with without dialogue you know and this film's kind of a testament to that you didn't need a lot of dialogue to I don't want to say understand what's going on because I will admittedly was pretty lost through most of it. I will say when I first saw it, I was like, this needs more dialogue. (laughs) You have to let it sink in. You have to like take in the story and understand the values that the movie was trying to represent. Then it makes sense. After two days, I'm finally able to say, I understand what the hell's going on. (laughs) Um, Speaking of not knowing what the hell's going on, Gawain meets that scavenger in the woods, and to me, he immediately looked like a criminal. Yeah, well, he meets him on a battlefield full of dead bodies. (laughs) That's a red flag, ladies and gentlemen. And he's like, I think my brothers are here. I don't know. Yeah, I love that he has like a very tattered kind of olive green outfit. But everything about him looks very bandagey, very gauzy. It's just kind of like tattered. Even his chainmail looks like a little ripped up. Yeah. Which... It's clearly pieced together. And then I, I love his like his necklace of like rings he's stolen off body. Yeah, but apparently Gawain doesn't know how to read a room. He so doesn't. he's just like, Oh yeah, where's directions to the place I need to go? Also I'm looking for the green knight in a green chapel. Like too much information going. Yeah. And the guy's like, oh, yeah, I know where that is. And he's like, okay, cool, thanks. And he's like, you're not going to give me anything for that? I look real scary. You're not going to give me anything? Yeah. He gives him, like, two pieces of, like, money. And I'm like, I'm, that's clearly not enough. He gives him two shekels. <laughs> gives him two shekels. And then he is subsequently just, like, ambushed in the woods by his scavenger team of misfits. Which, that girl, though, when I first saw her... Her, like, the way her hat was, I was like, does she have cat ears? <laughs> I was like, does uh, she, like, cosplay? Like, <laughs> I would not have been surprised in this movie, honestly. But, yeah, no, I love the way the costume designer put together the looks on these scavengers because it did feel very different from what we've seen in Camelot area. Like, it felt like these people were very of the elements and were piecing together their costumes from probably people they've killed or people that were already dead. Yeah, and I like this because you get to kind of see more of his costume as well, because they've taken his cloak, but he I believe he does get that back. Uh, they've taken his cloak, his chain mail, his belt, which his mom told him not to take off, but whatever. <laughs> he's kind of... Well, his mom probably didn't think he was going to get mugged 15 minutes into his journey. That's true. But when he's laying on the ground, you get to see these amazing, I believe, leather, like, riding pants he has on, like, are laced all the way up his legs and, like, go over his shoes. It's so cool. Yeah, those are dope. I love those. I wonder if how comfortable they are, but it makes sense because he's supposed to be riding a horse for, what, a week or so? Yeah. Six days. 
Six days. That's a lot of horse riding. Yeah. <laughs> but he escapes. He gets at least his sword and his cloak back, which I'm like, okay, cool. At least he didn't lose that that great cloak. Yeah, I was upset. I'm like, you better not lose the cloak that fast into this journey. No, but he he gets what he can back. And he's laying in the bed just trying to get some sleep because he's like, cool, nobody's here. Great. But he's awakened by a woman whose name we find is Winifred. And she's like, I need your help. And he is very confused by her request because she's like, I need you to go out to the pond in front of my house and uh, retrieve my head. I was assaulted by a traveler much like yourself. So he cut off my head and threw it in the pond while I was sleeping. And Gwen's kind of like, uh, okay, are you going to give me something in return? And she's like, what? No, I need my head back, please. And he's like, well, I'm about to get my head chopped off, so I'll go get it for you. So he jumps into the pond, has some, like, trippy little, like, vision thing about the green knight, but retrieves her skull, uh, walks back up to the bedroom where her headless skeleton is peacefully sleeping in the bed. And he just puts it right back where it belongs on the pillow. I love this scene. I thought it was so cool. This, I would love to just like read a story behind the scene, but it was just very interesting. I thought it was really cool that they put this in the film. Yeah, this was my favorite scene. Winifred played by uh, Aaron Kellyman. She was wonderful. She was, like, the only funny person in this movie. (laughs) Like, this was, like, the comic relief scene, and it was, like, not super funny. Totally. And it's funny because I never really see her as, like, a a comedic actress, too, because we know her now from Falcon and Winter Soldier and the Han Solo film. Um, She's a young actress. I believe she's only 22. She's stunning. Yeah. I love the costume she was wearing. It was, like, a white kind of ghostly gown which is what told me that it was a ghost or a vision of some sort yeah the fact that she didn't like notice you when you first walked in like she's a ghost but it's like it's beautiful it's like super like gathered i don't think it's pleated i just think it's gathered and just like drapes around here and it's just like billowing it was gorgeous oh yeah that's beautiful it's such a like cool modern take on the ghost too which i thought was really awesome and i also love because he's like wait you have a head and she's like you just see it there it's not i don't actually have my head and he's like wait are you a spirit (laughs) like is that is that why and she's like what does it matter i need my head back (laughs) the world's sassiest ghost she's like cut the man just go get my head just get my head this isn't the conjuring yeah (laughs) she's like just get it put it back Yeah, I don't want to be in one of your horror movies. Just go grab my head so I could go back to sleep. Yeah. And you could go sleep somewhere else for all I care. Uh, Yeah. And I'm like, oh, he was, like, sleeping on top of her skeleton, I think, like, earlier. I mean, that bed looked nice when he got there, though. Yeah, that bed looked dope. I was in the dark theater watching. I was like, ooh, look at that bed. There are some good beds in this movie. (laughs) Yeah, they got some comfy beds in Camelot and this region of England. Ooh. Every bed, they, like, jump on it. I mean, there's another bed coming up in a few scenes. So I was like, damn, that's a good bed. I'm like, I could live in that bed. Like, <laughs> I, I've i got lots of inspiration for, like, a new bed. But anyways, <laughs> do you want to go to bed? I'm tired. No, I'm kidding. Wow. I know we're vampires, <laughs> but we can't be vampires all the time. <laughs> so that was a great scene. Um, after I, I'm hoping Gwen got some sleep, but he jumped into a pond and had to get a dead girl's head. So I'm going to guess not too much. Gwen continues on his journey and he comes across a very nosy fox who seems to really have something to say, um, but doesn't say it. He's just following him. The fox is just following. The fox is so cute though. I'm like, I want a pet fox now. It is so cute. Uh, Gawain goes about his journey, comes across some rough terrain, and finds a colony of naked giants marching through the wilderness. I will admit, Elizabeth, I have no clue what the f*** is happening Um, in this scene. (laughs) There are, like, I I think Irish legends of 
uh, giants in like Northern England and Ireland, maybe Scotland. So I think that's where that's coming from. <laughs> I kind of figured, like, I know that there's like historical legend references throughout. I guess I just haven't heard that one, but I mean, it was beautiful. I thought it was interesting for sure. And, um, you know, visually stunning. So <laughs> after Gwen tries to talk with the giants and doesn't work out, yeah. He <laughs> He's like, "Can I can I get a ride on your shoulder?" And I think the giant did try to pick him up, but I was like, "That." The giant didn't really have a lot to say. He just basically was like, ah. I think the right. giant was just as confused. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anyways, Gawain keeps going. Finds himself in a bad storm, so he heads off to this very conveniently found castle in the middle of nowhere. Oxidor, and he found a place to stay for the day. Night. Yeah, he finds a place to stay for the night, and he's, like, looking rough at this point. His clothes are a mess. He's, like, been tripping on mushrooms. It's just, like, a whole... He's a whole <laughs> yeah, mess. This uh, little vacation trip, this Live, Laugh, Love tour he's planning on going on has been nothing of the sort. It's no. been a mess the entire beginning to start from being mugged. It's all because he couldn't spare more coin for that <laughs> scavenger. <laughs> That's the only reason. Oh, my gosh. I know. Yeah. And he just needs to give off, like, some stronger energy. But anyways, let's take a break, and when we come back, we're going to finish out the rest of this very beautiful film. Yes. Are you ready for the end, Spencer? <laughs> I think so. You better be. <laughs> it is wild. So he gets to this castle, immediately passes out, and he wakes up to this lord he does not know, but the lord knows him. And he's like, what's going on? What's, he's like, you're fine. Don't worry about it. The green chapel is like right over there. You got three days to complete your quest, pretty much. So don't worry about it. <laughs> hang out here. I go hunting all day. So you can hang out here, get your strength back, you know, and then go face the Green Knight. And he's like, oh, okay, I guess. So he's at home all day with the hot young lady of the house who looks strangely like his lover back in Camelot. Essel, and she basically spends all day trying to seduce Gawain, and he basically is like, I can't do this, and ends up fleeing the house to escape her, and ends up early to the Green Chapel. He shows up early. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, he literally shows up early, and he's just waiting there. <laughs> um, I love... These castle scenes, because some of the most beautiful costumes are in these couple scenes. So good. Specifically on the lady. Yes. I mean, that, like, blue velvet gown that she wears for... Oh, uh, with the plunging neckline. Come on, man. I mean, this gown is just... Ooh. It's, like, it's like ruched really beautifully. And then she has this, like, sheer, like, cape. Sleep, like not really sleeves, but like a sheer cape around her. And apparently she's into photography, which I was like, this is an interesting take. Okay. <laughs> um, but she looks great. She has that like that white outfit with like the the very like it's lacing, but it's it's very um simple. It looks it looks 3D printed parts of it. Yeah. Did I just hear a cat? My cat needs to be let out. Hold on. <laughs> I'm watching Elizabeth take her cat out. She, I, like, put a chair next to me so she could, like, sit here and be petted by me. And I was like, oh, I hope you just sleep here the whole time. And then, like, as we started, I see her get up and start pacing in front of the door. And I was like, no, 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 don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Um, anyways, we're talking about the lady's white outfit, too. 
I do like it almost looks like 3D printed like webbing on her but it's like a really beautiful lace. Yeah. Um the jewelry she wears, the hairstyles are oh, just Oh yeah. They're out of this world. Also, I didn't realize that the lady's also played by Alicia Vikander, who also plays yeah. Essel. I mean, I did not realize that till I was doing my research today. Yeah. They really transformed her for both roles. They do. And it took me because, like, when, as soon as he sees her, he's clearly, like, freak, freaked out in a way, like, I know you, but I don't know you. And then when I got home, I was like, Hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it never slapped me when I was at the theaters. I was just like, who is this lady? She's so beautiful. Yeah. I was just thinking, I'm like, wow, like the actresses in this movie are just so stunning. Little do I know it's just the same actress. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> She's stunning. Her husband's kind of an oaf. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of a dork. I do like his costume, though, because he's a hunter and he has like a lots of fur into his outfits. Which I oh, think is yeah. really cool. His, like, sleeping jacket, I feel like, it's, like, again, that, like, really beautiful, like, burnt orange color with, like, the huge fur, like, cuffs and, like, the fur lining. I was like, ooh, that's good. Ugh. Sometimes I wish I lived in a colder climate where I could wear stuff like this. But instead, I'm just in the pits of Los Angeles where it's just always 150 degrees outside all the time. Spencer. You could come here. You could come live here. We could get an apartment. I mean, I'm thinking about it. Like I said, I was watching Mayor of Easttown, and I'm like, these are my people. We could we could <laughs> rent a house and devote an entire room to podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a cool idea, actually. Um, another costume that I was obsessed with was Gwen's black coat sweater that he's wearing the textile on it is just so beautiful i want to touch it so bad yeah i really the textiles in the in this section where he's at the castle are out of this world like you want to like feel all of them yeah where did they get all these i'm just obsessed with every fabric i see i know and i love (laughs) when she's like really trying to seduce him And he just notices the belt, his belt around her waist, and he's like, "I just please give me the belt." (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, lots of weird hocus pocus that's going on around here. I couldn't figure out what her motives were. I was like, "Is she trying to seduce him because does she want something?" I don't know what's going on. If Dave Patel walks into your home looking like that, come on. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. I just, my mind wasn't there. I was just like, every single person in this film, you know, this is such a like trippy movie. So every time something happened, I said, oh, oh God, now what's going to happen? <laughs> like what mushroom I know. induced, you know, vision is going to start happening. So I just, I know. it was like, th- this castle scene was so like, you know, nothing really too crazy happened. But the whole time I was on no. edge, like the entire time. I don't. When she was taking his picture, I was on edge. I was like, "What is happening?" Like, yeah. also, oh, is this the portrait of Dorian Gray? Like, is he going to yeah. see his dead self? I don't know. I don't know because I was so confused. And then I see her like move the thing. I was like, "Oh, it's like a pinhole camera deal." But I was like, "Where'd she get the chemicals for that?" <laughs> also, another thing that made everything feel a little bit more odd was the older woman with the blindfold. <laughs> Yeah, I think, so that's supposed to be King Arthur's sister, Morgana, Morgan Le Fay, whatever you want to call her, because she's the one who kind of, like, set all this up. That's supposed to be her. Yeah, that's what I felt, because at the beginning of the film, you saw her when she was doing original spell, she, like, blindfolded herself. So, and I didn't really put this together when I was watching it. But after a couple of days, I'm like, oh, maybe this is her way of watching her son the entire time, like with the blindfold, because the fox isn't walking around inside the mansion. So she's like using this uh, woman. Maybe they're all also witches, too, because the younger woman had the belt, too. I don't know. I have some questions, uh, <laughs> but I I think that's what was happening. I think you need to forward me those 
those videos you were watching because I'm like, as much as I know, I'm still very confused. Yeah, I was watching YouTube videos before this, trying to be like, what's going on? I love it. I mean, yeah. it's such a great movie. Oh, it's great. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, so after that crazy moment, Gawain left the mansion, and now it's time to really get down to the plot of the story. We are at the Green Chapel. After a very nice-looking sleep, I love how the Green Knight opened his eyes a little bit, and he's like, it's not Christmas yet. Like, yeah. I need a... He hits snooze. <laughs> <laughs> the Green Knight totally hits snooze on that. <laughs> He's like, He's like, you're you early. Wait. I'll chop your head off in the morning. Come on, Nobody man. likes an early party guest. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Uh, so when the Green Knight finally awakens, the Green Knight's basically like, are you ready to do this thing? And Gwen's like, yeah, sure, let's do it. And then he gets down on his knees, and he's like, oh, like, is this actually it? And the Green Knight's like, yeah, I'm going to chop your head off. Like, I don't know what part was unclear to you. When I said, I'm going to do exactly what he did to me. So Gawain starts to panic because I think he thought like some sort of like party was going to start happening or surprise party where all of his friends would jump out of the bushes and say surprise. But no. Yeah. Because the Green Knight called it a game. You generally don't die at the end of a game. Yeah, that's fair. And Gawain panics and runs away. He says, I can't do this. He gets back to Camelot and this begins a montage and throughout this montage, a lot of different things happen. A lot of different costumes appear, which we'll try to break down in a second. But um, King Arthur's on his deathbed, and in his deathbed, he knights Gawain. And he's then given the crown after his passing. So that beautiful halo crown is given to Gawain. Then we witness the birth of Arthur's son. Of Gawain's son. I don't know what the hell's going on you here. You said Arthur's son. <laughs> the birth of Gawain's son happens with Essel, who unfortunately is having a very tough time. What makes it even more tough is after she finally gives birth, Gawain's like, okay, well, we're done here. And she's basically just, <laughs> just, just thrown out into the streets, which is very, very chivalrous of a Sir Gawain. Just abandoned. Um... And he demands to marry a noblewoman. So during his reign, Gawain enters a war. He takes on a very beautiful wife. During this war, Gawain's son is killed, which is very unfortunate. Things are not going great for Gawain. I mean... He's having a really cr crappy life. Yeah, being king was not always cracked up to be, you know, his... He had to leave his girlfriend. His son's dead. Looks like the world's at war. Uh, Camelot's been breached. His enemies are at the doors of the throne room. Yeah. Um, his mother does not look very happy about this. You know, things are quickly falling apart. As the place is breached, um, Gawain then takes off his belt and just basically accepts that this is the end. And suddenly, to all of our surprise... Gawain wakes up and he's back w with the Green Knight at the Green Chapel. So we realize that it's almost like his entire life just flashed before his eyes. And honestly, he had a pretty shitty life going forward. Yeah. <laughs> and very impressive to me, Gawain basically takes off his belt and says, actually, let's just play the game right now. You could chop my head off. And <laughs> I love that the <laughs> Green Knight's like, okay, finally, like that's what I've been trying to say. And He's almost like, I am proud of you. Now let me chop your head off. I'm proud of you. And he says, off of your head. And that's it. And he strikes a blow. You don't see it happen. And we'll talk about that in a little bit because I have some different theories also. So let's talk about all the costumes we saw from this montage before we talk about our final thoughts. So my favorite costume of this montage is like, I'm going to guess it's like a foreign princess that he marries. Because they're, like, the way they dress is so different from everyone in Camelot. It's all this, like, pleating and layers. And I was just like, oh, girl, your people have a good style. Oh, I loved it. It was giving me very, like, Queen, I think it's Elizabeth. Yeah, Queen Elizabeth. Elizabethan. Yeah, it's giving me, like, very Queen Elizabeth vibes. Um, I love that one film, which it's escaped. I think it's just called Elizabeth with Kate Blanchett. Oh, I have never seen those. Oh, that's very good. 
But it's giving me those vibes, but also like Mary Queen of Scots. So it's also like she's definitely from like an outside land coming in. Yeah. Well, with the blue paint, she might be Irish or Scottish. That's what I was thinking. Um, but that white outfit is just so beautiful. I know. I mean, she looks like an angel walking into the round table. Yeah. Um, I also love Gawain's final outfits, too. When He looks good as a king. Not going to lie. Especially when he gets a little bit older, too, and he has, like, the gray in his hair. But the crown looks good on him. The textiles, again, like, the textiles that go into, like, his his top and like the collar it's like this gray kind of really nice textured fabric i'm just obsessed with it yeah it looks so good his coronation his coronation like get up that's kind of what he's wearing throughout the rest of it but it just kind of like changes color yeah i think as he ages it just almost it almost looks like the garments kind of age along with him which is pretty cool actually but Still, the entire time he's wearing that green belt, he's wearing that green belt. He won't let anybody take it off, which I'm like, that's awkward, but okay. <laughs> and then when he's abandoned in the um in his throne room and he starts to take it off, I'm just like, what's happening? And then his head comes off. Oh, yeah, that was pretty scary. <laughs> I was like, okay. Well, also, my thing is... Why now? Why are you taking off the belt the first time you actually need it? Um, well, no, I think because he knows... He knows he's f***ed. And, like, they're either gonna horribly murder him or, like, parade him around and then horribly murder him. I thought, like, no harm could come to him, though. Well, if he keeps the belt on, but... I'm sure they're going to rip that belt off him. So either way, his head would have fallen off. Oh, yeah. It is a fabric belt. I just realized it, it wasn't like surgically yeah. in his body. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, but yeah, I love all these scenes. I love like all the armor and the war scenes. It's all very beautiful. I thought the costume designer Malgozia did really awesome with all the armor. Even just like, like looking at the pictures of the coronation with all the men and like the very classic medieval yeah. armor silhouettes. The white. Very beautiful. It was. It was just, it was beautiful from start to finish. I would not be surprised, Elizabeth, if this movie was nominated for an Oscar for costume design. I think that it's that worthy. It's very, very awesome. Oh, yeah. Costume design, set design, cinematography, and Dave Patel all deserve Oscar <laughs> nominations. Yeah, but you heard it here first. We are predicting that this is going to be an Oscar nomination for costume design next year. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's kind of talk about the ending here, our final thoughts. You have a little quote here that I think you should read. Oh, yeah. So the original ending of The Green Knight, basically, Gwen keeps his belt on and only receives a small cut from the Green Knight. Uh, He kind of goes back to Camelot in shame, but, like, they forgive him. Like, he's learned his lesson. Whatever, whatever. Um, And uh, David Lowry's quoted in a Vanity Fair article, I wanted to write an ending where his head gets chopped off, and that's a positive thing. That's a happy ending. He faces his fate bravely, and there's honor and integrity in that. So, I guess he gets his head chopped off at the end, even if even though they so, don't show it. Yeah. I mean, uh, likely, I feel like his head was chopped off. That's a good point. But then also at the same time, the Green Knight almost said it in a way where he said, like, now off with your head. And, like, almost, to me, almost felt like a joking matter. Yeah. So, is it very likely that he actually chopped his head off and that was in a movie? Yes. I think that's a very, like, that's... Definitely could have happened. But also, this is the first time where Gawain actually did something that was honorable and full of integrity. Throughout this entire film, he fell prey to seduction. He wasn't courteous. He was always demanding things of people. Even when a ghost lady asked for his head, and he was asking the ghost lady, like, what he could get out of the deal. Yeah. Like, Gawain was not, like, an honorable knight in training. So this is the first time he actually did something right, I feel like. Yeah. So I... I feel like almost this could have been his mother's way of kind of making him grow as a character. So maybe maybe his head wasn't chopped off and the axe didn't go all the way through and he learned his lesson. Maybe the axe did go all the way down. 
Either way, I feel like the point was that he learned all the moral things we're talking about earlier. Generosity, courtesy, chastity, uh, chivalry, and piety. Piety? Piety. Piety. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that was the point of the ending. I think that I think so many too. people will conceive it in different ways, but at the end, I think that was the soul of what happened here. Yeah, I agree. So that's the Green Knight, guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that was crazy. But it was fun, and I actually loved it a lot. I kind of want to go back and rewatch it now that we've talked about it. I think I'll rewatch it when it's on, when it's out on like streaming. <laughs> yeah, it. I don't want anyone to be confused. We love this film. I definitely re- recommend you see it. Yeah, we were a little confused at times, but you have to let it sink in and just take in the visuals and these going to be one day Oscar nominated costumes. Just really take it all in because it's really worth it. It is. Well, Elizabeth, what is our next adventure going to be? So we're bringing it all the way back to the modern age, Spencer. We are watching Space Jam, A New Legacy. Oh, Hell yeah. I am so excited. I am a huge Space Jam nerd, so I am so excited to see the new film. I like, can't wait. Oh my gosh, I'm going to annoy you with all my Space Jam love next week. Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, give us a like, a follow, tell your friends about us, and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye. The Art of Costume Blogcast is hosted by Elizabeth Joy Glass and Spencer Williams. Produced by Elizabeth Joy Glass with associate producer Spencer Williams. Our sound design and engineering is done by Daniel White. Follow us on Instagram at The Art of Costume Pod. Or visit theartofcostumeblogcast.com for all blogcast updates. For more costume reviews, deep dives, and interviews, visit theartofcostume.com. A blog dedicated to highlighting the best in costume design. 